Hello and welcome to Somerville Community Access Television and our continuing coverage of election 2016. No, not that election, our local state elections. As many of you know, the presidential election season is well underway and so are the elections for representatives on Beacon Hill in the Massachusetts legislature. As part of the mission of all community access television and media centers to keep the public informed about our elected officials and government, we are pleased to bring to you the candidates for the 27th Middlesex District. The district includes only the city of Somerville. The candidates for the 27th Middlesex Representative District are incumbent State Representative Denise Provo and challenger Aaron James, candidate of the Pirate Party. Stay tuned and check our local listings for when this program will air on SCAT TV throughout this election season. For SCAT TV, I'm Joe Lynch, and as always, stay safe, stay informed, and please don't forget to vote. Thank you. Hello and welcome to this candidate profile of Aaron James, a candidate from the Pirate Party for State Representative from the 27th Middlesex District. This district encompasses most of the city of Somerville. A native of Arizona, Aaron now call, proudly calls Somerville his home. He lives in the Ward 5 district of Winter Hill. Aaron's campaign is focusing on electoral reform, substance abuse issues facing many families and individuals in the district, mental health issues, and the criminal justice system. Aaron will face incumbent State Representative Denise Provost in the November general election. It is my pleasure to welcome to this program candidate for State Representative Aaron James. Welcome back to SCAT TV. I appreciate it, Joel. We yeah. talked about you being on another program. That Henry, Henry Parker <laughs> scoops my guests all the time. So <laughs> welcome back. Good. You Thank are you. first time candidate. First time candidate. First time candidate. Aaron, for those folks who may not know anything about the Pirate Party, mm -hmm. why don't you just, if, if you want to talk a little bit more about yourself and then what the Pirate Party's platform would be. Yeah, absolutely. A big one for us is transparency in our government and privacy. And uh, I want to be focusing on the transparency. Uh, we have got to be getting, no records should be confidential for the most part, especially at the state level and all of these procedures. Th there are so many question marks as to what's happening in our state government. Th there shouldn't be these question marks. Uh, I like to focus a lot on the marijuana legalization and medical marijuana. What's happening behind closed doors isn't something the public should be questioning. That's something that we need to be a part of in the decision making, the law making, and that whole process. Uh, so the Pirate Party is really big on transparency in government and getting people not only active, but actually a part of the whole process. Uh, and personal privacy uh, on the internet and just in general. Uh, we know the internet is now a huge uh, surveillance tool for the government. Uh, being, you know, it's advocated for in the name of security, um, which makes some sense, but that doesn't mean we need to lose all of our privacy, especially when it comes to the internet. How much of it, though, you know, it's interesting when you talk about the privacy part. The internet seems to be a dumping ground for people to give all of their private information to the general public. So how, I, I, I guess, help me with the platform of the Pirate Party saying that um, privacy is of number one concern, but transparency and open records is another. Help me reconcile that when it comes to the government. Right, we want it, we want the government to be more transparent, and we want our privacy, our personal privacy, to not be as transparent. If there's something, if you have a Facebook and it's just friends, you should should be for friends. Uh, you don't want the government overseeing everything like that. And then using that. And another thing we need to consider when it comes to a big part of my platform is breaking through the two-party system. Uh, it is controlled by Republicans and Democrats, and here in this state, it's mainly just a Democrat state especially when it comes to our state legislator. Uh, and when it comes to the information they have from internet activity, it's enough to put together viable campaigns left and right. Uh, so it becomes almost impossible uh, to break through that. There's a lot of things that they're looking at. The Pirate Party is big in across Europe. Uh, Iceland, they have a big presence. Uh, and they're growing across Europe, really. And it's great to see them coming to the United States. Uh, but they're looking at a lot of uh, internet reforms um, that that really do stop the government from overlooking a lot of this this personal stuff, and, and that's something 
something that is important for me, but I don't want to focus too much on the privacy aspect. We're forming this party in the United States here, and the big one for me is transparency. Uh, I want our government to be open, and I want us to not have those question marks, especially at the state level. Um, the only thing there should be any question marks for is when it comes to national security. Uh, but you're not really dealing with that too much at the state level. And so who makes that decision, just for my own information, who would make that decision that it's for national security or it's for the privacy of others? It, it, would you leave that in the hands of local and state government? Or is, well, should I think that be dictated by the federal? Very good question, Joel. I think we should have a committee set up um, of representatives f elected from the people every two years. And I look at ideas like that, not necessarily people we elect to write laws. Uh, so we, we've got to start kind of separating the process of writing laws and the process of approving and implementing them. So you have a state legislator to write them, and then the people need to come in with their say and s somehow vote up or down, give their approval outside of just elections. It's so hard to beat incumbents now that incumbents can pretty much left and right introduce whatever they like. And, and it's really hard, especially if they're never contested, uh, for anyone to really say you know, no on, on what you're doing there. Um, and there's a couple pieces of legislation that my opponent has introduced that I have question marks with um, that I'd love to get into discussions with her about when it comes to drug reforms and how we deal with the opioid epidemic. Mm -hmm. If you want to move into that, Aaron, I know that you know you, you are a terrific advocate for the reform issues when it comes to how people with addiction are treated, not only by the medical industry, but by the state when it comes to criminal justice reform. If you want right. to talk a little bit about that. Right. No one should be in jail or prison for nonviolent of criminal offenses. Uh, Marijuana needs to be legalized. It is not the drug out there killing folks. Uh, in fact, evidence is out there that it can assist folks in coming off of opioids uh, and drugs like heroin. And it's a shame that we're, we're not fully tapping into that benefit of marijuana. Uh, but I also believe you have a constitutional right under the First Amendment to smoke marijuana. Uh, and the basic principle of pursuit happiness as you see fit without interfering on someone else's pursuit. The main point is to be as productive as you can be. You want to be a productive member of society. And whatever happens on the side really doesn't matter. You're smoking a little bit of pot, you're drinking a little bit. If you show up to work, you're a good family person, you're a productive member of society, that is the key. And that needs to be the focus of treatment. How do we get you to that point? Uh, you tell a lot of folks, you know, we want you to go into treatment. You need to put down every single drug. You can never have a bear again. You can never smoke pot again. That, that creates the rebellion. That creates the, the angst. And that creates the epidemic we have, I believe. You're saying it may create more problems than it cures. Absolutely. It yep. turns people away from seeking treatment. To say, to put the problem on them and not look at it as a mental health issue. And I totally believe that drug addiction is a mental health issue and it needs to be approached as such, not a criminal justice one. And the crimes and the things that result of it are symptoms of that mental health issue. You mentioned your, your, your challenger or the opponent in this race. One of the issues that um, I think has come to the forefront is medical marijuana dispensaries. They are now, um, the voters of the Commonwealth said yes, they are needed. They will be opening up in Somerville fairly soon. Um, Exciting. Representative Provost was one of the co-sponsors, I think, of that bill, saying, yes, there is a need for this. When it comes to the medical use of marijuana versus the overall legalization, are there caveats in there in terms of the overall legalization? You would still have punishment for driving under the influence, driving, for instance? I think we need more studying on that. Um, another, another point I make is that we're all different. Drugs affect us differently. And, and that's something I don't think we take into effect with our 100% you know, sobriety for everyone. Is we're not take, it's crazy when you think about 300 plus million people on this planet. No two people have the same brains. Um, is, do some people claim they can drive better and smoke? I don't believe them. I don't think it, it just doesn't make sense. But there seems to be evidence that points that maybe some people are better drivers. And we need to study that more. So I, I'm not convinced one way or the other on that. No one should be facing criminal charges. No one should be, have a, even a ticket 
for smoking marijuana. These are revenues I want to be putting into our state budget. We need to be. There's some, uh, our rainy day fund is, is, is going a little bit dry here. We need to be putting money into it. We need to get more people out of treatment into jobs. And a lot of the proposals I want to be looking at uh, are centers for businesses to hire people from treatment and centers for people to seek treatment. Uh, I offered one thing at PirateCon we had last week on uh, the idea of a, the state offering to buy back heroin two for one. Uh, so we'll give you $2 street value uh, for every heroin you turn in. You go in, you seek treatment, you come out of treatment, you work. After your first week of work, we'll send you a check two to one for the heroin you turned in. Uh, hopefully someone thinking about shooting up for the last time before uh, going to turn themselves in I say, hey, you know what, I'll get a little bit of help when I get out. And instead of shooting up, they'll go turn their dope in and get treatment. And the focus of treatment is to get a job. Get a job and then follow through with that job. If you smoke a little bit of pot, if you drink a little bit, if you make it to work and you're there for your family, that's not a relapse. The relapse comes if you hit your spouse, if you don't show up for your kid, if you miss a day of work. How do you monitor that kind of a proposal, Aaron? Well, the buyback program would be a, a good way to see that it starts out from the start. Um, if someone turned themselves in and they turn in the heroin and your state has a check ready to go out for them and there's no completion of work, you kind of have a little sign there, oh, this person, something happened there. Yeah, and, I, and let me go to the second part of where you say, you know, you go to work, you show up for work, you get your paycheck, you're a good family person. How do you monitor that part that of it, the, you're a good family person? Yeah, that, that, that really is relying on the family. Mm. Um, you, you can't really, if the family steps forward and says something, um, that's one thing. But the, the work aspect, you can. So you think the legalization of marijuana is a way to fill some of the um, emptiness of the state coffers? State coffers and to help fund my two to one program. Got it. Uh, it's, a, it's estimated to be a billion dollar industry here in Colorado. Yeah, I, 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 here in Colorado. Colorado legalizing it's a little bit under a billion. Here in Massachusetts, it's going to be about a billion dollar industry in the first couple of years. Uh, we need those revenues and we need to stop prosecuting folks for marijuana and stop looking at it as part of this problem. It's not. And as part of your platform, you know, the proposals that you put forward for these issues would take some of the burden off the criminal justice system. Right by pulling first time offenders or marijuana users out of the criminal justice system, taking repeat offenders out of the criminal justice exactly. system, thereby pressing the cost down. Exactly. Okay. And focus on treatment even for people in prison. Um, everyone I believe has something to offer this world. Everyone. And, and I think in many cases society misses this with a lot of folks and kind of tosses them off and just kind of forgets about them and everyone has something to offer, something inside. And I'm in recovery myself. I've always been in the government and politics and this is my passion and so I'm pursuing it. And I also, 2005, 2006, I got really disturbed with government, lost a lot of passion there and I kind of got way off track at that point. And I've kind of come back around and I realized part of, part of the problem is this two party system. And, and hence the Pirate Party. Exactly. Putting a candidate up for state representative. Exactly. Aaron, I told you that the 13, 14 minutes is going to go very, very <laughs> fast. We are at the end of our time. People can see uh, more about you and the issues that you are talking to voters about on your website. Give the voters your website. Yep, it's voteaaronjames.org. I didn't quickly say ranked choice voting, one of the key things I'm trying to run on too, where you can vote for more than one candidate. It helps open up third parties and it's something I want to get implemented here in Massachusetts. Terrific, I want to thank you for coming in to SCAT mm -hmm. TV. Best wishes on uh, November 8th. Thank you, Joel. You're welcome. Appreciate it. My guest has been Aaron James, candidate for state representative. As always, stay safe, stay informed, See you next time. Hello, I'm Andy Metzger of the State House News Service, and welcome to this candidate profile of Denise Provo, the current state representative for most of Somerville and candidate for re-election for representative for the 27th Middlesex District. Representative Provo was first elected to the House in 2006. She served the city of Somerville first as an employee, then as alderman at large for seven years. A Maine native and attorney by profession, she and her family have made their home for many years in the Ward 5 district of Somerville. 
She has served on the Joint Committee on Transportation, the Joint Committee on Higher Education, and on the House Committee on Personnel and Administration. Representative Provo will face Pirate Party challenger Aaron James in the November general election this year. It is my pleasure to welcome to the program Denise Provo. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Andy. So you were uh, an employee of Somerville. You were actually the city attorney, is that I, right? I was an attorney for and, the city of Somerville. And now you're in the state house. Uh, mm -hmm. How has your perspective on state government changed from when you were working in Somerville City Hall as an attorney to today when you're working in the, in the legislature? Well, when I, was, when I was an attorney for the city, you know, my relationship to the legislature was consulting the Constitution and the general laws and making sure that that the city complied with the laws. Um, and then when I was on the Board of Aldermen, uh, the question of local aid and state funding and MBTA assessments and other, other um, financial items um, came in more into the foreground. Uh, and it was actually, that, that's what got me interested in state government um, as, as the ultimate place to get recourse for the people of Somerville. And now that you're in state government, how has your perspective changed on city government where you used to work? Uh, well, I, you know, I still have tremendous appreciation for anybody who serves in city government. It's hard work. Um, I have a lot of respect for it. I still do a lot of work with Mass Municipal Association. Um, you know, we did a, a municipal modernization bill uh, a couple weeks ago, and you know, I, I moved into it as an amendment, um, a piece creating local option control to lower speed limits, which I've been working on for more than 10 years. So um, it's all connected. Right. And your district, unlike many of your colleagues, you only have one city within your district. Does that make things uh, simpler for you? It's, yes, it's, I, I feel really spoiled. Um, and I, I think it would be hard for me to have divided loyalties, especially because I started out in a position where, um, where I would stand up in court and say, I represent the city of Somerville. Unfortunately, I often said, I'm representing the defendant city of Somerville. Um, but I feel so identified with Somerville at this point. I think of colleagues who have three or six or more communities to represent, and I think, how do you do that? Well, that kind of opens up an interesting area. In what are some of the interesting uh, cases that you had to defend the, the city on, if, if you can? Uh, uh, well, I can certainly recall. What can I say about them uh, within the attorney-client privilege? Um, uh, I often had to defend lawsuits against the police, um, uh, sometimes for excessive force. Um, at least once for wrongful death, a couple of um, jailhouse suicides, um, a lot of negligence cases, um, cases at the appellate tax board. There were a lot of lawsuits pending against the city when I first came to work, cases in the, in the federal courts. The first thing that I had to do was, was brief a case that was being appealed to the First Circuit. Um, and that was a, that was a, a discrimination case against the police, but by a police officer. I think it was a race discrimination case. Anyway, there were um, there were many governance issues in the city that dated back to before I went to work for Jean Brune, and um, that were still working their way through the system. Um, and on your amendment to the municipal modernization bill, how low could speed limits go uh, under that? Ah. Well, um, I'm glad you asked. Right now, the, the lowest speed limit in a, um, a densely settled district is 30 miles per hour. Um, under this bill, municipalities could opt to have a 25 mile per hour limit on local roads. It wouldn't apply to state road or 
or, the, or divided highways and you know bigger roads that have higher limits anyway. But on local roads, 25 miles per hour, plus it allows for the option of um, what are called safety zones that are similar to what we have now as school zones uh, with a 20 mile an hour limit, but they could be around uh, senior housing or a senior center or a playing field or park or any other kind of um, area where there's a lot of pedestrian traffic and vulnerable users where you want that extra degree of safety. So is that similar to what Boston is trying to do uh, in lowering its speed limit? Uh, it's similar but not identical to the Boston Home Rule Petition. But you know what I, what I learned over the years of working on this is that uh, what's now MassDOT um, which came into existence in, in 2009. It used to be a bunch of unconnected agencies. But MassDOT has always insisted that they want one rule for the whole state. They won't do speed limits by home rule petition. And it's been a challenge all of these years um, finding a way to do that that's acceptable to municipalities and acceptable to MassDOT. And do you think anyone would actually follow uh, 25 versus 30? Or? Uh, well, eventually, I, th I think so. Um, I think that you know it's partly education, partly enforcement, um, and I think in I think if you experiment yourself with with um, driving at a lower speed. Um, in, in the urban core, um, it's, you discover it's smoother because you're not hurrying up to stop at the next light. And it also feels safer where there are cars and parked cars and bicyclists and people in crosswalks. Um, uh, there, you get more of a, a gliding and less hurry up and wait, hurry up and wait if you slow down a little bit. Speaking of transportation safety, sort of. Uh, your opponent is uh, identified as a member of the Pirate Party. And I was wondering if you could name some way in which you are pirate-like in any way, or, or maybe a way in which you are absolutely not pirate-like. Uh, I don't know a great deal about the Pirate Party, um, although I've looked at their website. Um, certainly, I, I have been uh, a strong voice in opposition to the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, which I know the Pirate Party opposes. And I've done educational events in the State House and in the district to help people understand what would be um, so damaging about the agreement um, if, if it were uh, if it were adopted, it, actually, it's a treaty. It would be entered into by the executive. And, and Congress, of course, gave fast track authorization. So it'll just be an up or down vote. But it's not just a, a federal issue, because one of the provisions of TPP would give corporations the right to sue governments um, to put a stop to regulation which they can do now under NAFTA. And in fact, the, there's a lawsuit pending against the United States for, um, for not giving the OK to that huge pipeline that's supposed and, to go And they're just asking for money in that lawsuit, right? They don't want to actually get the State Department to overturn the, the ruling, right? Well, asking for money damages, though, is, is a huge club. <laughs> Uh -huh. to, to wield over a government. And, um, and governments have had enormous uh, awards of, of damages um, against them. Um, some countries for have, have actually, have, it's called investor state dispute settlement. It's outside the courts. Um, but company, uh, countries that, that have tried to reduce cigarette smoking have been successfully um, challenged by tobacco companies for uh, non-tariff impediments to trade, and then they have to pay them vast sums of money. Um, there was a huge 
uh, a year ago, March, there was a big judgment against Canada because Nova Scotia denied a permit to um, a company that wanted to come in and blast in the Bay of Fundy. And I think we only have a couple minutes left, but uh, you, you've been in the House for 10 years. What should voters read into the fact that you don't hold the chairmanship or a vice chairmanship? Uh, that I am independent, and um, I oftentimes um, agree with my party, but if I do not, I have no hesitation about casting the right vote as opposed to the vote that surged upon me. I voted against um, the very bad solar net metering bill that came before the House last November. Um, I voted to keep term limits for the Speaker. You can't exercise that kind of independence and expect to get um, extra goodies from leadership. Those are those are reserved for people who fall in line more than I am willing to do. And what's your proudest vote this session so far? This session, well, um, it wasn't just my vote, my bill, the transgender non-discrimination bill that passed the House overwhelmingly um, on June 1st. I would say uh, it, that, that bill is a heavy lift. It, was, it made people really uncomfortable and jittery when, when it, in the last session, certainly, and then earlier in this session, and getting it to the point where only 10 Democrats voted against it and eight Republicans voted for it to have, um, to have a bipartisan supermajority on that bill was one of my proudest moments ever in my life. Well, uh, Representative, thank you so much for coming on. And if you want to tell the viewers where they can uh, find out more about you. Oh, my, my website, for instance, right, yeah. uh, deniseprovost.org, P-R-O-V-O-S-T. It has silent letters in it. Got it. Well, great talking with okay, you, Okay, thank you, Andy. Uh, all right, and that does it for this interview.